Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Roger Perchette. I am the Managing Principal with Interface Engineering, and I want to welcome everybody to uh, the next session of the Interface Engineering uh, Free uh, High Performance Building Webinar Series. And uh, just a couple notes, you know, Interface Engineering, we're a 51-year-old uh, engineering firm, multidisciplinary design. Uh, our offices are in D.C., Chicago, L.A., Portland, San Francisco, and Honolulu, and we have a strong focus on uh, high-performance building design. Uh, so the webinar series uh, has uh, been extending now for a couple months. This is the fifth session uh, in the series, so we're nearing our halfway point. And uh, the course that you will be hearing today is an AIA-accredited uh, lecture. Uh, Interface is an AA accredited course provider, uh, and the course will offer uh, one learning unit. Uh, you should have, when you registered, uh, uh, included your AIA number if you have one, and uh, based on that AIA number, you will receive one learning unit uh, uh, that uh, we will do the reporting for you, so you don't need to uh, self-report. Uh, if for some reason you've neglected to provide your AIA number, uh, you may email uh, Emily Williams, uh, that's Emily W at interfaceeng.com, and she will make sure that you get a certificate and that you are uh, also reported uh, to the AIA. Uh, so it is uh, my great pleasure today to uh, introduce our, our two speakers. Uh, the first being Mr. Craig Burton. Uh, Craig is a, a brilliant engineer. Uh, he's an associate principal with Interface Engineering. Uh, he's one of the leaders in our Chicago office uh, as a licensed uh, professional engineer and a lead accredited professional. Uh, he also serves on the board of IBSA in Chicago. That's the International Building Performance and Simulation Association. Uh, he has his, uh, a bachelor's degree from Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. And in 2014, uh, Craig was named uh, the top 20 under 40 uh, for Engineering News Record uh, magazine. He has 16 years of experience. I, I first met uh, Craig, uh, I think about 16, 17 years ago uh, in London, and I may have been the, the person that convinced Craig to move from Europe uh, to the United States. But through the years, I've had the great fortune of working with Craig on a number of exciting projects in the United Arab Emirates, in China, uh, in Malaysia, and uh, here in the United States. Uh, so, um, so happy that uh, Craig is uh, with us today. Uh, I also am pleased to uh, introduce you to Kulai Salitra. Uh, Kulai is also a brilliant engineer, electrical. Uh, he's an associate principal in our Washington, D.C. office. He's a professional, licensed professional engineer in six states. Uh, he has his bachelor's degree from Polytechnica University uh, of Bucharest. Uh, he's a certified electrical plan examiner, a certified commercial energy inspector, and he's also a Fairfax County, Virginia plan reviewer. Uh, in the DC office, we simply refer to Kulai as the professor. Uh, so some of uh, Kulai's projects include uh, the Net Zero Energy AGU headquarters, the Net Zero George Mason High School, the Net Zero Arlington County Group Home, and the Net Zero Sully Woodlands Education Center. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Craig Burton to take it away. And and uh, and uh, and again, thank you both for uh, sharing your knowledge with us today. Well, thank you so much, Roger. I couldn't have given a, a, a more glowing welcome if I did it myself. Um, uh, thank you, everyone uh, that's uh, joined us for the call, um, and I uh, hope that we are able to impart some uh, useful knowledge today uh, around our experience. Um, this is the AA course description to sort of clarify the intent of the lecture. Um, I won't go over that, but I will go over the learning objectives. Um, so that everyone's clear as to what uh, we're, we're trying to communicate um, and the way that we'll do it. So um, the primary objective is to um, educate the uh, audience on the fundamental components uh, of a microgrid. You know, what are the, the pieces that we need to have a, a microgrid and the different forms it might take. Um, we're going to cover uh, the differences between alternating current and direct current as it pertains to uh, the power that is distributed and stored and generated in a microgrid. We're then going to look at um, within uh, direct current 
power systems, uh, the different class of power that um, is utilized, class one or class two power, um, and how they can potentially um, bring benefits to uh, a microgrid typology. Um, we're then going to dive into a few examples of projects where we've actually built uh, direct current microgrids and where we've looked at uh, uh, microgrids as a way of uh, addressing various project uh, uh, goals. So the agenda uh, that will help us take us through those uh, objectives, um, so first we're going to cover you know, what is a microgrid. We're then gonna go into the theory around alternating current and direct current. Uh, we're going to cover um, the uh, real drivers behind direct current, the advantages. We're going to go through some efficiency uh, gains calculations, uh, address how controls can also be integrated into direct current systems in a way that uh, currently is not possible with alternating current. Uh, we're going to show you some examples. We're going to talk about an emerging uh, direct current technology referred to as digital electricity. And then we're going to leave you some takeaways. With that, I'm going to hand it over to QI uh, to give you sort of an overall introduction to a microgrid concept. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> so the question is, what is a microgrid? The electrical industry has many definitions for a microgrid. <clears throat> One of the definitions from the Department of Energy define a microgrid as a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources within clearly identified boundaries that act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. A microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid to enable it to operate in both, both grid connected or islanding mode. Let's present various components of the grid. Generation. <clears throat> Generation components can be a renewable type as solar photovoltaic, wind turbine, small hydroelectric plants or biomass plants, or non-renewable emergency generators, micro turbines, et cetera. The storage <clears throat> for energy is optional, but can be storage batteries, flow batteries as known regenerative batteries, kinetic energy or flywheels, or simply compressed air energy storage. The third component are the loads. The loads can be as defined AC type loads, motors, HVAC appliances, etc., or DC loads, <clears throat> high efficiency motors, appliances, computers, servers, etc. Controls is the fourth component and is a device that provides communication between distributed energy sources, grid, photovoltaic, wind, storage, and loads to maintain acceptable level of frequency and voltages. And the last one, it's the grid. The grid <clears throat> get connected to um, intelligent breakers that can disconnect or connect the grid back to the, back to the source. An AC microgrid have only AC components, and the components are utility generators, wind turbines, and AC loads. A DC grid or microgrid have only DC components plus the utility, solar, batteries, DC loads. And a microgrid also can be a combination of the two. It's exactly what you see in this uh, slide, call it as a hybrid AC-DC microgrid. The microgrid sizes can be defined by voltage level, phase, KW of peak load, KW of generation capacity, KW hours or number of customers. The usual size of a microgrid is between hundreds of KWs to few megawatts. If a microgrid is sized between 50 to 100 KW, we, call, we can call it as a nanogrid. If a microgrid is sized less than 50 KW, it can be called a picogrid. Nanogrids and picogrids have the same components as the microgrid, but, a, but at a smaller scale. The nanogrids and picogrids are usually de deployed for small commercial buildings and residential solar photo photovoltaic systems. 
The microgrid provides power to campuses, small urban and rural areas, or small commercial buildings, or even for a simple house. The microgrid could be the answer or our answer industry to the energy crisis by encouraging use of the renewable sources. Transmission losses get highly reduced by using the microgrid by not overloading the existing transmission lines. Installation of microgrids results in substantial savings and cuts emissions without major change in lifestyle. Greg, can you move to the next slide, please? And here you go, AC to DC. When it started? Starting in the late 1880s, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla were involved in a battle now known as the War of Current. Edison developed direct current, current that run continuously in a single direction, like a battery or a fuel cell. During the early years of electricity, direct current, shorthanded as a DC, was the standard in years. But there was a problem. Direct current is not easily converted to higher or lower voltages. So it couldn't it couldn't have been transmitted to longer distances without a lot of spending in adding multiple substations. Tesla believed that alternating current, or AC, was the solution to this problem. Alternating current reverse direction a certain number of times per second and can be converted to different voltages relatively easy using a transformer. The Chicago World Fair also known as the World Columbian Exposition, took place in 1893 at the height of this war. General Electric bid the electric <clears throat> to electrify the fair using Edison direct current for almost a half a million dollars then, but lost to George Westinghouse, who said that he could power the fair for only less than $400,000 using the alternative current of Mr. Tesla. The same year, the Niagara Falls Power Company decided to award Westinghouse the contract to generate power for Niagara Falls. Although some doubted that the falls could power all the Buffalo, New York, Tesla was convinced it could power not only Buffalo, but the entire Eastern United States. On November 16, 1896, Buffalo was lit up by the alternating corner from Niagara Falls. By this time, General Electric, had decided to jump on the alternating current too. It would appear that alternating current had all but obliterated direct current, but in recent years, direct current has seen a bit of a renaissance. Today, our electricity is still predominantly powered by alternating current, but computers, LEDs, solar cells, electrical vehicles, all run on DC power and methods are now available for converting direct current to higher and lower voltages. Since direct current is more stable, companies are finding ways of using high voltage direct current to transport electricity for long distances without less um, electricity loss. So it appears that the war of current may not be over yet, but instead of continuing in a heated AC versus DC battle, it looks like the two currents will end up working in parallel to each other in a sort of hybrid partnership. And none of those would be possible without the genius of both Tesla and Edison. Next slide, please. So what is alternating current and what is a direct current? The alternating current, AC, is an electrical current which periodically reverse directions. And it used you know, to deliver power for businesses and res residences, and it in a form of electrical energy that consumers typically use when they plug kitchen appliances, television fans, electric lamps. The AC can be delivered in single phase or a three phase system. The alternating current frequency is the number of cycles per second in an AC sine wave. So the voltage and current, as shown in the graph, change the direction up and down 60 times in per second in US and 50 times per second 
in uh, the other part of the world. The, direct, the, the DC current, on the other hand, is an unidirectional flow of an electrical charge. An electromechanic, electromechanic chemical cell is a prime example of DC power. Direct current may flow through a conductor such a wire, but can also flow through semiconductors, insulators, or even through a vacuum as an electron or ion beams. Direct current may be converted from an alternate uh, current supply by use of a device called rectifier. On the same time, the direct current may be converted into the alternating current via a device called inverter. So next slide, slide please. So let's talk a, a little bit about the common voltages and application for alternate current and direct current. The AC side of the distribution has matured over the last 130 years and standardized the utilization voltage to the following, 480 volts for commercial, 240 volts residential appliances, 208 volts commercial distribution, 120 volts residential or commercial. On the other hand, the DC market had not developed standard voltages level yet. So in today's market, we are going to see a lot of voltage levels such 380 volts from emerging emerge alliance distribution voltage, 60 volts on commercial for power over internet system, 48 volts, 24 volts, 20 volts, 12 volts, 5 volts. The Emerge Alliance is the open industry association developing standards of DC power distribution in hybrid houses and commercial buildings. They are going to standardize to two voltage levels to be used, 380 volts and 24 volts. The circuits using voltages greater than 50 volts are called line voltages, sometimes class one circuits that are not safe to operate live, where the circuits using voltages less than 50 volts are called class two circuits. This class two circuits were limited to under 100 watts are safe to touch. And this presents um, a big opportunity of savings by not using high skilled labor or, or needed, or um, you know, they're able to use actually the light. So you know, 50 volt is not going to, um, to kill you. So, um, Craig? Great, thank you, Q-Line. <clears throat> so thank you for the introduction, explanation of AC and DC. Um, I'm gonna talk now quickly about, um, you know, why DC provides potentially an attractive alternative. Um, so we're using DC uh, power uh, throughout our buildings. Um, and um, we're, we're really having to live with the legacy of AC power um, uh, due to the fact that it's the source. So on the left here, we see um, all of the accessories that we typically require to power uh, a home or a business um, from alternating current. And then on the right, we see the loads, uh, whether they're computers, phones, lights, um, the components of a microgrid, batteries and solar, um, that are now becoming more commonplace in our buildings. Um, and because of the legacy of the war of currents, um, we have a lot of um, uh, AC sort of infrastructure that uh, is required to rectify the AC power to a useful DC power. All of these components that we refer to as bridges in some cases, um, uh, Indicate or are typically the lowest uh, point of reliability in a system, uh, are a form of uh, great inefficiency of energy loss um, and an additional complexity and cost. So by adopting or looking towards uh, an, an all DC uh, power typology, we can look to remove all of these accessory uh, devices uh, that are only there because of the legacy of AC being the prevalent. Uh, uh, power distribution typology. So let's take a look at a typical one bedroom apartment. 
um, uh, and look at the, the devices that require power. So here's an electrical uh, layout, um, and I've added some annotation here to suggest uh, what the power demands are of all of those devices. So uh, receptacles, lights, uh, appliances, HVAC equipment, and ultimately the, the voltage ratings that each of those devices requires to, to, to operate. So in this slide, I've annotated uh, what the actual demands are uh, for, um, for those devices. If we, uh, if we ignore um, the fact that um, uh, in an AC world, we only have 120 volt AC to deliver. Um, and in fact, all of our LED lights, the majority of the receptacles that we use for powering convenience uh, appliances, telephones, desk lamps, uh, clocks, etc., all require uh, a lower voltage, something below 60 volts DC. So the opportunity to replace all of those devices here shown in blue and purple um, with a low voltage device is real. When we look one step further and at the appliances that typically dictate the largest amount of power demand in a residential unit, um, and that we typically supply with 240 volts AC, um, you know, higher voltage class um, uh, power. The majority of the appliances that you purchase today or you specify on a project actually are DC driven inside. Um, and that's something that's happened over the last 20 years as appliances go towards more of a smart uh, appliance configuration. Uh, that have additional digital controls that use inverter technology um, and that have basically put all of the power distribution within the appliance uh, on the DC side. So again, the potential exists to replace those 240 volt AC appliances with um, what uh, is somewhat becoming the standard of a 380 volt DC uh, typology. So if we look at uh, the remaining needs in uh, a residential unit that are alternating current uh, inherent demands, they're very limited. So this helps to build the case for why does DC uh, a useful uh, uh, technology to look at um, in this day and age. So efficiency is something that's often overlooked in the electrical distribution uh, world um, because ultimately our, our, our opportunities for um, uh, putting in more efficient or, or more uh, uh, unique infrastructure is typically limited. But when looking at um, AC power distribution versus DC power distribution, in this analysis, we've added the components that um, the building would see between the source being the utility come into the building um, all the way to the actual uh, LED uh, fixture, so the LED in the bulb that's creating useful light. And this is um, you know, an analysis that shows that if we were able to remove uh, some of the AC to DC conversions, we would actually achieve uh, and a, a, a percentage savings, you know, between 81% to 86%. Um, so, you know, over, over a, uh, almost a 10% improvement in uh, retained energy consumption to drive uh, that, that LED. When we look at a microgrid typology uh, where we have solar and batteries that are being used to power those loads within a building, um, the inefficiencies associated with generating DC and then converting to AC to store in DC in your batteries and then to draw out again and convert from DC to AC before distributing in the building and then finally converting from AC back to DC at that LED light fixture the amount of opportunities for energy loss is uh, compounded um, and this calculation shows that um, you know, our, the amount of electricity we're able to retain from that kilowatt hour of electricity generated at the solar panel jumps uh, from 62% to 75% uh, 
when following a DC uh, building typology. So uh, that's why DC power and DC microgrids, especially as they pertain to highly efficient net zero energy uh, buildings or buildings that include some component of solar and storage is particularly relevant um, uh, in this day and age. Uh, the USGBC, uh, through their uh, LEED uh, accreditation program, uh, has recognized this. Um, there's many individuals um, uh, in different organizations that um, have spent a great amount of time uh, canvassing for more attention to DC power and the efficiency associated with it. So LEED has now introduced the pilot credit um, for uh, DC power systems. Uh, and I encourage you all to, to look at it and consider it for your, your, your next projects. And with that, I'll um, uh, hand it back to QI to talk about uh, some of the control opportunities that exist with DC power. QI, you may still be muted. Sorry. Direct current power or power over internet. Um, that to distribute uh, DC power to many available devices on the market, an IEEE standard technology called Power Over Internet, or POE, is used. The Power Over Internet describes any systems that pass electrical power along with data on twisted pair and Ethernet cable. You might be familiar with the Ethernet cable from uh, low voltage and uh, data. This allows a single cable to provide both data connections and electrical power to devices such as wireless access points, IP cameras, motion sensor, daylight sensor, which allows to deliver more effective energy savings policies by implementing daylight harvesting or um, tighter timeouts. There are several common techniques for transmitting power over Ethernet cables. Three of them have been uh, standardized by IEEE standard 802.3, as shown in this uh, table. And um, this standard is known as alternative A for type one, alternative B type two, or for TPOE. The original standard uh, 802.3 in, was developed in 2003. And this uh, standard provides up to 15.4 um, watts um, power to each port, but only 12.95 watts is assured to be available at the power device um, as shown on the top of the table. Looking at ways to increase the amount of power transmitted, IEEE has defined um, another standard, IEEE 802.3BT for PPOE, in September 2018, the standard introduces two additional power types up to 60 watts that deliver 51 watts to the device, and type three up to 90 to 100 watts that is able to deliver up to 70 watts, uh, 71 watts at the device. This development um, opens the door to new application and expands the use of applications such as high performance wireless access points and surveillance camera or office distribution receptacles where you can plug directly your laptop or desktop. Uh, nowadays, the laptop and the desktop use an average of 50 to 60 watts. So using this uh, PoE Ethernet uh, Type 4 will pro uh, deliver enough power for you to, to use that, um, that receptacle. The power over internet is delivered or over category five or better uh, cable to a maximum distance of 328 feet. So you have a better opportunity to use, you know, these cables for longer distances without uh, worrying much about the voltage drop. PoE installation reduces materials and labor costs by using a, symbol, a single Cat5 or six or better connection for power and communication. This uh, greatly simplified the installation process, saving time, minimizing safety risk. Uh, next slide, please. The, the direct current power USB universal serial bus. 
the industry developed specific DC connectors to power all DC devices. The universal series bus, USB, is an industry standard that established specification for cables and connectors and protocols for connection, com connection, communication, and power supply between computers, peripherals, and other computers. Um, the standard was released in 1996 with um, the first generation ESB1. After that, they follow with the more um, up upgrades on ESB2. And um, in 2011, they developed the ESB3. That allows a, um, a super speed um, transmission data up to uh, 5 giga. The 2014 was followed by the USB 3.1 and 3.2 um, in 2017. And in 2019, the latest and greatest is the USB 4 that allows super speed uh, up to 40 gigabits per second. The, as you see in the receptacle socket identification, you know, the standard ones are the type A, type B, that everybody is familiar with uh, with them on your phone. The type B um, under USB 1 and USB 2, I believe you, you'll see it a lot on the printer. And then, you know, uh, after uh, releasing the USB 3.2 and USB 4, um, the industry standardized to USB C that Nowadays, pretty much the phones, the laptops are are using it. In the US, okay, sorry, the USB power standard, as you can see on the right, um, the voltage driver is either five volts or twenty volts. But what is important is the last uh, uh, column that you can, you know, we started with a lower powering device of zero point five watts, and nowadays we can deliver power up to 100 watts. Next slide. So let's see it. You know, the plugs and the receptacles. On the top left corner, you are going to see the traditional USB 1, USB 2, and the smaller one is the USB C. After that, we, we find the uh, category 5, 5E, 6, 6A, and 7, um, the traditional data cable. Then we have a barrel connector plug, followed by an Anderson safety degree 400 volt AC DC. Most probably, the the industry uh, is going to standardize around a cable similar to this uh, uh, Anderson safety safety grid with the following feature: make it first break last break last connection. Provide the safety of the earthing pad before engagement of the power contract. Um, the hot plug rated, the connectors are rated for current interruption for both electronic and electrical loads. Touch safe, that minimize the risk of personal contact with hazardous voltages, even at this high voltage, 400 volts or 380 volts. And also provide arching protection. Housing contain the arc uh, if connectors are made or unmated uh, while under uh, load minimizing risk of personnel. The power density that you can transport with this Anderson safety grid, they can go up to 400 volts AC or DC and up to 30 amps. Next, please. The AC, AC uh, DC microgrid uh, hybrid eco ecosystem components. So in this picture, um, you are going, we're going to show you the different type of uh, components that we discussed previously in the uh, first step, um, slide. The utility connection. The connection between the utility and the building on the back is done through um, medium voltage switches that field, that uh, feed uh, transformers, and they lower the uh, higher voltages, 13.2, 5 kVA, or uh, even higher voltages to a more utilization voltage of 480 volts to 771, 120.28. Then we have the on-site generation and the storage. The on-site generation could be PV. Then the, the, from the on-site uh, generation um, in the buildings, you are going to find these blocks of, um, uh, that will help distributing or providing the conversion from the AC or DC 
to a DC uh, utilization voltage of 24 volts or 48 volts. The power hub device is AC. They will, they, they will be able to receive AC or DC input, and they will be able to deliver low voltage DC output to various components. The same, the same uh, principle also is followed by the power of the internet switch, but in a smaller, in a smaller uh, scale. The number six here is uh, our traditional uh, in ES uh, 120 volts or 125 volts, 20 amps or 15 amps socket that have been added with or fitted with um, USB type A or type B and also with a USB C that will help us to, you know, charge our phones quickly and easily from, um, from the traditional socket. The next one is the DC DC driver for the LED fixture. So, in order for us to um, power the uh, LED LED light, we need this device that will uh, allow connection to of, of this Cat5 Cat6 cable to the LED light. And after that, there are two examples of the cables, traditional cables, uh, Cat5e or Cat6e, that uh, they will be able to provide the power and data that is needed. Next. So now we're going to talk about two examples. One is the American Geophysical Union, followed by another example that Craig is going to present. It. The American Geophysical Union is a nonprofit professional scientific organization whose members came from different fields of earth and science, that space science, has a guiding philosophy grounded in a single notion, science for the benefit of humanity. So when the system inside the, its aging uh, Washington DC headquarters, headquarters become to crumble, AG officials has had a decision to make. They could fix the fall, failing systems in the near, nearly 25 year old building and leave the rest of the structure intact or take the whole thing down it starts and starts over. Seeing the opportunity to design an entirely new green workspace, they adopted uh, for the later. The building um, will feature a rooftop a solar photovoltaic panel installed horizontal on elevator structure, um, structural superstructure. The design team um, was implementing uh, almost 22. Um, high performance strategies. And those strategies, I will name a couple of them. Solar photovoltaic, sewer heat exchange system, DC power workspace, direct current LED lighting, dynamic toilet room exhausting, variable frequency drive, occupancy sensor and control, energy usage dashboard display. Some of them, they are using, they are impacted by, directly by the use of DC power. And those are solar photovoltaic PV, dynamic glass shading, daylight responsive control, triple pane glazing. They are using a power, DC power to, uh, to, um, to change their colors. Occupancy sensor control and energy usage dashboard display. So the photovoltaic, as I said, PV system generates electricity that uh, provides building LED lights, um, a ceiling grid, computer monitors, and workstations. The photovoltaic uh, system is installed on the roof horizontally, but also it's installed vertically on the south side of the roof because we needed, the design team needed to increase the amount of surface that is needed to meet a certain uh, power requirement to make sure that the net zero, um, the net zero um, energy requirement is met. So implementing the 22 high performance strategy um, will uh, provide the AGU um, with an annual um, energy building consumption that more, not more than 300 uh, megawatt hour annually. The PV system itself, you know, will be, pro will be able to provide almost uh, 346 uh, megawatt hour of energy. Next, please. 
So here um, we are showing the the DC distribution for the for the AGU that utilized the existing electrical 208 120 volt infrastructure that was part of the 1992 renovation and the new 380 volt DC microgrid powered by photovoltaic system. As I mentioned before, the, the overall capacity of the PV system is approximately 258 kVA based on 717 360 watt sun power module. The design intent for the 380 volt DC microgrid is to directly utilize the generated DC power by the majority of the LED lights and workstation while any excess power is back, feed, uh, back to the utility. So um, the DC microgrid is set up uh, to the traditional uh, AC distribution. Each PV module will generate power at approximately 60.6 volts DC. Multiple PV uh, panels will be connected in series and that uh, um, in a string, and that string will convert the voltage to 300 volts DC using a string optimizer. The string optimizer will be connected in parallel and will be combining combiner boxes and fed into the 300 volts DC bus that is shown on the top of the of this um, uh, uh, diagram. The same 300 volt, 380 volts DC bus will also be fed from a second source that supported during nighttime and cloudy, cloudy days, because we know um, sun is not available 24/7. That second source DC is an AC DC rectifier fed from the local utility. And that is the LTEC 90K WACD rectifier that will take power directly from the AC and will be able to power the 380 volts uh, DC. For the DC microgrid to function as described above, it will depend on the 380 volts DC voltage levels uh, produced by the PV system and a voltage set point assigned to the inverter. The voltage set point assigned to the inverter will allow the inverter to only invert the excess power produced by the PV system. This set point is typically between 382 volts DC and 383 volts DC. So during the um, day, um, we are going to experience three different scenarios um, for the PV production. When the PV power generated is larger than the DC load power consumed, uh, the DC bus voltage will rise slightly about 380 volts. Um, and uh, once it reaches a set point, um, the AC will be back fed in the to the utility. When the power generated by the PV is equal or to the DC load, then the voltage will remain constant at the DC uh, bus and the PV will continue feeding the DC load. If the consumed power by the DC load is more than generated PV power, the rectifier will convert the utility power from the AC to DC, supplementing the remaining power uh, required by the bus. Greg, next one. The original DC distribution concept was uh, to provide the uh, power supply that is going to um, provide power to an energized um, DC grid, uh, ceiling grid. Unfortunately, uh, one of the suppliers uh, was not able to uh, provide the uh, actual connector that is shown on the right hand side. So the, the design team then uh, decided to go directly uh, and feed every single light with the cables from the power supply to the light, AV securities and other components. Next slide. So this is the power driver or power hub driver that uh, uh, was supplied to um, AGU and it's receiving power directly from AC system or DC system, but not in the same time and delivers low voltage, 24 volts to, to the various loads. So um, the power supply has available 16 channels, each channel able to deliver 100 watts. Only 15 channels will be used to uh, power uh, LED lights or receptacles. The 15 one will be designated just for the controls. 
The uh, receptacles that uh, have been used uh, at the AGU are the ones that are showing on the right hand side. And you see there are two type C ones or a combination between type C and uh, ESB1 and 2C. Well, cool. thank you uh, very much for that um, uh, project review. Um, I'm going to sort of rattle through the last slides here relatively quickly so we keep some time for Q&A. Um, so please stay with us um, as we sort of finalize the presentation here. So this is a project that we have. It's in construction. It's in uh, Virginia, Arlington, so uh, closer to the D.C. office. Um, it's a single-family home uh, going to be built to uh, FIAS uh, Plus net zero rating. Um, uh, very uh, uh, engaged homeowner um, who understands um, you know, where the trends are going with DC uh, power and DC devices uh, and wanted to look at uh, an overall DC uh, power typology for the entire house. So we've been working with them for the last few years um, on um, really the analysis and specification of uh, DC loads in the home and integration with the, uh, the solar and, and storage technologies. So I'm going to keep this relatively high level and show you how a traditional home is powered. So a traditional home has an AC uh, utility connection, uh, a meter, an AC panel that then serves uh, the AC loads in a house. Um, when you add solar and uh, onto a, a conventional house, you're uh, placing a DC source, the solar panel on the roof. You have to pass it through an AC to DC inverter to, to make AC power to then feed into your panel and AC loads. Um, uh, when you add uh, storage, so a battery uh, storage functionality into that same system, you have to add your batteries. You have to add a separate inverter. So now you have two inverters. Um, in order to take the power that's converted, that's generated from the solar, convert it to AC, uh, direct it to an inverter to generate uh, DC, store as DC, and then again to pull it back out. And you can probably appreciate the inefficiencies that are associated with that. Um, in comes what we refer to as a DC coupled um, and a, a DC coupled hybrid inverter. Um, and what this device does is it, it uh, incorporates a DC feed from the solar, but rather than inverting it uh, to AC to be used or stored, uh, there's a DC side to that equipment. Um, and we can then uh, supply uh, power generated from the solar to batteries and to DC loads off of that, um, that one inverter system. So that's how we've basically organized the house uh, electrical infrastructure for this home in uh, Virginia. Uh, and we've identified uh, you know, a number of the electrical loads in the house that can be fed off the DC side of um, uh, the, the hybrid inverter. Um, because of the nature of the house being uh, you know, fairly custom and high end, there's, there's quite a, um, uh, a functional uh, electrical uh, system to go with it. But um, we are looking at another project um, currently that's looking at more of an affordable, lower cost um, uh, typology for a DC coupled microgrid um, that can streamline some of the, um, the equipment and, and functionality. Um, so the one piece that we wanted to leave you with um, that we think is uh, you know, potentially going to be um, uh, disruptive to the entire DC uh, power um, uh, uh, system is the concept of digital electricity. So digital electricity um, is basically the same as direct current as uh, QI introduced earlier, uh, but it overlays uh, communication on the same pair of cables. Uh, and it does that at a frequency, you know, 700 times or so a second um, that it can tell uh, by monitoring the power line, whether there's a fault on that line. And uh, the ability to monitor and assess where there's a fault allows uh, the technology to uh, cut power, uh, so to stop the flow of current through that conductor to maintain safety on that line. What that means is um, you can supply 
high voltage or 380-ish uh, voltage DC power over a set of cables um, that would be treated uh, the same way as uh, what we refer to as class two power. And that's what QLI had referred to earlier as uh, power limited, so under 100 watts um, and nominally below 60 volts DC, um, which can be installed by a non-licensed electrician in many jurisdictions, does not require uh, many of the hard protective uh, natures that electrical systems typically uh, come with, including metal conduit and junction boxes, um, and can therefore uh, achieve a lower cost installation while uh, providing higher amounts of power. Um, so uh, a project that we've been working with um, and a client that we've uh, been working with um, on a number of applications at Sidewalk Labs, um, they've uh, actually built out a, a form of this digital electricity system in one of their, uh, their, their locations. Um, and what uh, you see here is basically where the digital electricity originates uh, and it's on sort of computer shelf type equipment, uh, the distribution wiring, so not in hard conduit, um, but this is 380 volt uh, DC power, which would typically be unsafe. Um, uh, these are receivers. So this is where um, the digital electricity is converted back to uh, more conventional DC power. So this is a low voltage uh, receiver and it puts out, as you can see on the far right, uh, power that serves more um, um, a conventional uh, desktop type uses like USB receptacles. Um, the receiver on the top um, uh, outputs a higher voltage, so closer to 380 volts DC, uh, that can power uh, large uh, packaged white goods, so appliances. And these are actually appliances that have been manufactured using 100% DC power, um, so they will not accept uh, an AC input. So this is uh, meant to illustrate that the potential for DC power um, is uh, very much uh, there, uh, and there are certain applications, clients that are interested in sort of spending the time to, to learn about it and the potential benefits. Um, one of the main uh, benefits that we've seen through our work with Sidewalk Labs is the potential for flexibility uh, in general construction. Uh, traditional wall um, you know, requires hard uh, fixed infrastructure behind the wall. If you want to adapt it or move it, um, you know, there's a fair amount of demolition and, and, and hard infrastructure that needs to be moved. With digital electricity that's potentially uh, run through baseboards rather than hard conduit, it can be easily uh, moved uh, or, or, or taken out. It doesn't require licensed electricians to do so. Um, it provides more flexibility in you know, the use of our spaces. So takeaways that um, you know, we think are important for uh, uh, attendees, um, a DC power through the a more clear split of uh, lower uh, voltage class two power has the potential to reduce uh, installation costs. Um, it has the potential to be the backbone to digitizing electrical infrastructure in a way where you're not putting in parallel systems to provide the same outcome. Um, there's energy efficiency gains that are uh, potential that are really just now starting to be understood. And there's a lot of research that's happening at the national level, lab level to, to better understand that. Um, provides more flexibility in the future, which uh, we think is very pertinent to uh, our current going back to work um, uh, post COVID or you know, during COVID um, uh, reality where uh, investments, space use planning is potentially uncertain as to what and how long it'll be permanent. Uh, digital electricity, direct current power allows very flexible uh, tenant improvement uh, and, and, and layout options. There's lead credits available. Um, this just the basic, there's so many loads in a building that are DC. Why are we providing them with AC? Uh, and it, the fact that it's a key enabling technology to enable electrification, decarbonization of our grid. Um, a quick plug for, um, our next webinar, um, which will be in two weeks from now uh, on radiant systems. Um, so look for that from our LinkedIn page or our mailing list. Um, uh, it'll be a great lecture. Um, and now we'd be happy to take uh, question and answers from anyone who's uh, uh, got a burning direct current question.
uh, and QLI, maybe you've had a chance to, to look through some of them. Yes, I did. I saw only one question, if uh, uh, we can get a copy of uh, your slides. And uh, definitely you will get a copy of the slides. Uh, a copy of this seminar will be uh, made available. Great. Uh, are there any other questions? We do have five minutes left. Otherwise, um, we'll, um, uh, we'll we'll park it there. And thank you all for your attending. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right, Th thank you, uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, thank you, Kulai. That was a great presentation. If anybody uh, does want to drop questions in, uh, we will be circulating a Q and A document uh, along with the. Uh, information on the AIA uh, certificates. So um, thank you so much for that. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Take care.